planning this for a long time now, I think. I'm finally we did it. So my neighbor has received the bachelor's degree in the in the North Sea, he returned to academia to complete the leadership at the University of Sheffield, where he was a senior research fellow in the School of Computer Science at the University of Manchester where he worked in the machine learning and optimization research group. Actually, that was the place where I met him. I'm the only Manchester PhD <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> My only Manchester graduate. Uh, in August 2010, he returned to Sheffield to take up a, col a col collaborative chair in neuroscience and computer science. And uh, so we are very happy to have you here. I think uh, when uh, eventually they write the machine learning history in Colombia, they, they have to call this event, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. Let's make it, if you guys go on to achieve things, then that will be the case, yeah. <laughs> so I, I want to thank some people here. I want to thank the British Council because they, uh, they help us to organize the event. Conciencias, uh, Doctoral in Ingenierias, Maestrian in Ingenieria Electrica. They are basically providing the the snacks for you later. <laughs> and some people in particular, I would like to say uh, to thanks to Alvaro Orozco, who is not here, who is the head of the group. Uh, I will introduce to him yes, uh, later on. Uh, Jamie, who is not here, Jamie is uh, our secretary. Uh, Marisol, who is also our secretary for the, for the postgrad uh, studies. Christian Borriso, who is, where is Christian? Christian. Christian. Maybe you already talked to Christian at some point, yeah, uh, two years so. ago, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Christian Marmizo and Joe Benquesta, for his own. They help us with, uh, with the code, mm -hmm. and uh, probably you can ask them for things you need to do for the coding in session, because they, they have a good grip of Python and uh, Great. Um, Python on Windows, which is worse. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so yeah, so thanks again to Neil. And, uh, Thanks, Maurizio. Yeah, it's absolutely true that we talked about this a long time ago. I think Maurizio emailed me, oh, I don't know, 2005 or something, 2006? 2007. Uh, 2007. Yeah. Uh, about doing a PhD uh, and then he came over to uh, as my first PhD student in Manchester and my last PhD yeah. student in Manchester. <laughs> um, and uh, one of the things I remember him saying is it's very difficult to uh, to know what's going on in the state of the art if you can't travel a lot, you know, if you're, if you're off the circuit. And uh, he, he always pushed uh, for us to do something like this and it was always in my mind. And in many sense, this whole sequence of summer schools comes from that idea, plus thinking, oh, let's do it in the UK, plus various things, oh, let's just prepare material to do this. So we did one in Uganda in August, but the idea for this one came uh, long ahead of that. Okay, so. Thanks very much for the introduction and thanks for the invite. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the visit. So this first um, uh, part will be coming from a sort of machine learning perspective and very similar to this uh, book, uh, the Rogers and Girolami first course in machine learning. I tend to use it for teaching at the master's level now. Um, I think it's quite, it shares the same philosophy with me. I don't like some of its notation, but broadly speaking, it's a sort of quite a good text. So the notes, I wrote my notes before this book was published, but when I looked at what they put in the book, a lot of it was similar to my notes. So that's probably ideal because you get two perspectives on the same thing. Um, of course, the book, my PhD supervisor, uh, Maurizio's grand supervisor, uh, <laughs> His grand supervisor was Peter Higgs, by the way, the, the Higgs boson. So oh. Maurizio's great, great grand supervisor <laughs> uh, has a Nobel Prize. Um, uh, was Christopher Bishop, and, and he writes in a very clear and lucid style. The book's uh, now seven years old, and it maybe tries to cover too much in one volume, so it can be hard to uh, read as an introductory text. 
but I think it's very useful if you already have some understanding and want to find out a particular area, that's a good read. That's the good we use for the master's course. Yeah. Actually for all the courses. I so I used to use this for the master's course, but um, I went to Rogers and Jeromey because it's a bit, um, it's more complete in the story. It tries to cover less, but we uh, still use that as a sort of text. And I'll put in notes, um, uh, to these books as we go through a little bits of reading that I think are relevant to the sections. Uh, so, I want to focus on regression, and, but I don't want us to feel that um, by doing so we're being restricted in um, the uh, scope of machine learning. Regression is about functions, and uh, I think, well, pretty much all machine learning certainly I work on can be turned into functions. Putting a function, learning a function. And regression is almost the most direct and obvious version. Because you're trying to predict a real value given some inputs. Uh, so for example, predicting the quality of meat, this is an old example, given some spectral measurements. Uh, so you've got some meat that you want to understand if it's good quality, if it's worth eating. And then you measure with some uh, spectral camera what the meat looks like, and then you predict whether the meat's good quality. So there's a data set called Tecator data, which is a uh, data set from the 90s on that. The C14 calibration curve is quite a nice one, so I don't know if, I don't know that much about carbon-14, but so carbon-14 has been in the atmosphere um, for a long time, and the assumption is when you look at a, an old plant, because carbon-14 decays at a certain rate, you can predict the age of the plant given how much carbon-14 ratio there is to the carbon-12, as I understand it. But the assumptions there, um, based on the idea that the carbon-14 concentration in the atmosphere has stayed constant, so in the air around us stays constant. And that's not quite true, so there's something called the carbon-14 calibration curve where people use tree ring measurements, so they look at trees. Actually, this can't work here because you don't get different growing seasons. In, in countries that have winters and summers, um, you get tree ring measurements, so the, the tree will grow. I guess that's why the wood's so much denser here. It grows only a little in the winter and a long way in the uh, summer. So you get these tree rings, but the quality of the summer causes larger or smaller tree rings. And what they do is they sort of plot these things on a, you know, if you get enough trees together, you can get the overlap of these things. And then you can date all the way back thousands and thousands of years. And so they have, they have this sort of thing archaeologists do. But there, it's also um, a, uh, an organic material, so it's also got carbon-14. So they use this to recalibrate. They've got the carbon-14 age, and they've got the uh, actual age from the tree rings, so they do a regression mapping from one to the other. And Tony O'Hagan's group, Tony O'Hagan is at Sheffield, is one of the first people to do Gaussian processes, and they've worked on things like that. Um, Another sort of more machine learning type task is uh, predict the quality of Go or backgammon moves given expertly rated training data. So you might have some candidate moves in a game. Um, so you want to build a computer that can play these games. And then you might have a series of potential moves and then an expert might rate these moves. I mean this is perhaps the less interesting way of building an artificial intelligent game. But you could then recreate what the expert might think by doing regression, encode these moves in some input vector and map to uh, a quality score and try and predict the quality of different moves in order to, uh, to make some progress. Um, there's a lot more. The more you go in, so in some sense, uh, Mauricio's PhD thesis was all about regression. But it started to be about... Uh, we have a, well, certainly the way of thinking that I have now about regression is much more general than these sort of specific cases because what you can start seeing uh, is, well I, well, I hope you'll see by the end of the course, is that these are all regressing over one different thing. But you could even ask questions about, well, what's the relationship between perhaps 
the quality of the meat and each different spectral measurement or the time the meat's been out and you can start including those sort of measurements and jointly module across for those for multi-output regressions and we'll see those later on and Maurizio's thesis was really about that sort of thing and you can get some very interesting data sets when you do that now um, the example uh, in Rogers and Girolami is this nice 100 meters running example so the idea is to predict gold medal times for the 100 meters um, for all Olympics from 1896. So that's a regression example. But I did this uh, example in uh, Uganda, and as I wrote that down, I thought, well, so th there's the data going from 12 seconds in 1896 to, uh, that's what, 9.69 or whatever the, um, so that's not even, that's not 2012, that's 2008. Um, now, because I gave this example in Uganda, um, Stephen Kipritic won the marathon. Uh, he's Ugandan. It was only the second ever gold medal for Uganda. So we thought to use this. They really like Stephen Kipritic there. Um, and it's also the data set's a little bit more interesting. So it's got some particular facets. So it looks similar. That's interesting in, as well. We're going to come back to that when we look at multi output regressions. So there's something going on in this data which is about overall human performance. You know, how much we're getting better, how much we're understanding about training, how seriously we're taking the Olympics. You know, in 1896, maybe everyone was like, okay, it's just a fun meeting in Paris. Um, so it's similar shape. But there are some interesting facets, like here, there's a very strong outlier. Now, I could, I could run a marathon in that speed, actually, just about. So this is pace. Five minutes per kilometer is there. Five minutes, 15. This is what they do. I could not run uh, two kilometers at that speed. That's extremely fast, and that's what they do. This is Kipritic here. Um, extremely fast, these speeds. But this one's very slow, and the reason it was slow is because the marathon was very badly organized that year. So... Um, you can read about it on Wikipedia, but the basically things happened like they got lost. Uh, all sorts of strange things happened. So um, it was run in the US. So you've got an outlier, which affects things. And outliers are interesting. So it's nice to have an outlier in your data. So we're going to use this as, uh, this, this, is, this is my joke, we're going to use this as a running example. Um, <laughs> Throughout the course, we're going to fit linear regression to this, Gaussian processes to this, uh, quadratic fits, um, various things to see what sort of results we can get. Um, and I think what you'll see is uh, you get out from a model what you put in, from a, sorry, from the data what you put in. So very simply put, what is machine learning? So this was data, but if we want to make predictions about what the marathon time is going to be in 2016, we need to make assumptions. So those assumptions, we normally include them in a model. Yeah? If you just have data on its own, my claim is you can't do anything. All you can do is say, that was the data point at that time under those circumstances. You can't even say that it's going to be the same in the future because that's an assumption about temporal continuity. You can't even say that it would have been the same had they run that marathon with a two minute later start. You know, you have to have assumptions about that the circumstances would have been the same. Even very simple assumptions that we think of like temporal continuity. Like it would be very surprising for you if I were to suddenly disappear from this side of the room and reappear on that side of the room. Yeah, that's difficult to do because it involves a lot of energy of molecule movements and whatever. So it's a very un unlikely thing to happen. So it's a good assumption that if I do move, I'll move sm slowly. Uh, temporal continuity, smoothness. That's the main thing we put in. Now, in the approach that uh, my group and other groups who I'd say are in the area of probabilistic modeling take to machine learning, you're very explicit about those assumptions. You put them in a probability distribution. They might be wrong, the wrong assumptions, for example, that data isn't linear, and we're going to assume it's linear in a bit, but you know how you're going wrong. Um, there are other areas where they claim to be being more assumption-free, but very often if you look down in the details, they are making assumptions. 
the minimum of which is smoothness very often. Um, so in the sort of philosophy of machine learning uh, as I do it, we try and be explicit about those assumptions. And the way we're explicit about those assumptions is by writing down models and departures of the world from the model. And if we do that, then we can make predictions. So the model, as far as I'm concerned, represents something really fundamental. I mean, this, here's a contrast between statistics and machine learning. If you're in machine learning, um, you have a slightly different goal from if you're in statistics. I've, in statistics, I would claim that you're trying to find the truth out about the data. So you're given some data, perhaps about, I mean, the early statisticians were interested in social things like the average income in Manchester versus the average income in London. And you see these two numbers are different. And you want to know if it means something that these two numbers are different. Does it mean people are poorer in Manchester? Or is it just a random effect? And humans are very good at seeing patterns, so good at seeing patterns, that we'll see patterns where there are none. So statistics is really about removing that tendency, telling us, stop looking at patterns where there are none, stop finding significance in data which is meaningless, and actually only fight, draw conclusions when you, you see something's correct. And that's really important. We can think of really good examples. You know, the worst uh, sort of, I'd say the worst. So if that were to not exist, things like drugs trials, so where you've got um, large pharmaceutical companies who've invested millions and millions and millions in some new drug for cancer, and then they test it, and there's no really significant effect. Unless you have an organization of people who are arbitrating whether the result is significant or not, then you know, society would be in a lot of trouble. A lot of people have a large amount of interest in, in certain decision outcomes, and they can fool us. Marketing's all about that, right? Insurance is all about that. Fooling you into buying something you don't want or need. Yeah? And that's maybe okay if it's just a shirt or a car or a CD or whatever else. It's not okay if it's a drug to improve our health. And statistics is the guardian of that domain. It's basically trying to turn humans into computers to make us understand rational decision making, which we don't always do. Now my claim is the reason why we don't do that is because we have inductive biases about how the world's set up. We look for patterns. We look for smoothness. And those, those patterns and smoothness we encode in our model. And, and we have this model about the world that fundamentally can't be correct because the world's far more complicated than we can imagine. But it's good enough for us to have evolved to where we are and make incredibly intelligent decisions. So, but you can show there's things wrong with our... You can, you can, uh, you can fool humans, you can show them visual illusions, you can make them believe things have happened which haven't happened by tricking our systems, tricking our model. But in machine learning, the, I, I claim the original objective, or certainly my objective, um, is, is more of an AI objective, that we want to make computers like humans. So we want them to have those inductive biases. We want the computers to be also seeing patterns, perhaps where there are none, but making good decisions in the presence of uh, sort of a difficult environment, a new environment. Um, how do you get a computer to do that? You want it to be more like a human. So machine learning is trying to make computers more like humans, while statisticians are trying to make computers, uh, humans more like computers. Neither of those things is possible at the moment. So actually we end up doing a lot of the same stuff. And I don't really mind, but a lot of the arguments between the two fields are about what your intention is. Um, and I think even, a, even statistics you could claim is this, but um, in statistics uh, you are sometimes being very careful not to introduce things to your model which could bias your decision. Whereas in machine learning, if you get good performance, if your robot performs well, in general, it doesn't matter. You don't have a $100 million investment relying on the outcome of these statistics, which is what you get in stats. Making decisions about across government levels about where to spend money, 
about uh, where to distribute drugs, about you know, economies, things like that. These are questions that involve millions and millions and millions of dollars constraining drugs companies. The robot, we're just trying to get it to do a sensible thing. Well, Lawrence, is that yeah. the, the difference between doing like Bayesian inference or frequency speed inference? No. Because with Bayesian, you're looking for, OK, sorry. <laughs> OK, that's an interesting question. So is that the difference between doing Bayesian inference and frequency inference? I think those things have got quite confused. And actually, I really like the thing Peter Diggle says about it, he puts it so much better than I am, and he's a statistician, so he's allowed to say it, whereas I'm a machine learner, so I feel bad to say it. Um, I have some controversial opinions on that. I think that the idea of Bayesian statistics is a bit of an oxymoron, because statistics is Bayesian, being Bayesian is about, being, about modeling, and statistics is about looking at the data and trying to tell what it says. So Bayesian puts model first, and st uh, classical statistics puts data first. Uh, but Peter Diggle summarized that really nicely. Um, so let's see if we can find what I'm referring to. I'm not going to find the... Uh, uh, so I just want to see if we can... Uh, get the talk up because I think he, he, um, he comes at these things what I love about hearing him talk is that he has exactly the same uh, well I agree with everything he says but he comes at it from the perspective of a statistician that doesn't seem to be working maybe have I lost the um, no it's fine I don't know why is that not working it was working earlier wasn't it um, ok maybe we'll just forget that I don't want to waste time if we can't find it but uh, I don't want to speak for Peter too much because I've done it before and uh, I may misinterpret what he says. And one problem when you work across these areas is the words are very similar um, but can be used to mean slightly different things. So um, that makes things confusing. But I, I think broadly speaking, this picture is good. How many people here would say they're statisticians? Hands up if you're a statistician. Just two, three. Do, they, do people agree with what I'm saying about statistics versus machine learning? <laughs> I don't know. Some people just say it's the same thing. I don't think it's the same thing. I think culturally it's different. Okay. So, linear regression is the first thing we'll look at because it's a model. In linear regression, what we say is that the winning pace, or the winning time if it's the 100 meters, is related to the year by some gradient plus some offset. So, and these parameters, and statistics is sort of keener on this part of it than machine learning, I think. These parameters have interpretations. So here's the data. Y is the winning time of pace. X is the year of Olympics. M now has a rate of improvement over time interpretation. How much better humans get over time. Um, and C is the winning time at year zero. So this is how much, how fast... Uh, Jesus Christ and the Apostles would have run <laughs> the marathon in. But you have to be very careful about these interpretations because as we we'll see with this model, even that's like going back over time, um, it would come up with, it would say they were ridiculously slow, you know, way slower than they would have been. Um, actually, I bet they would have been pretty good because people used to walk a lot in those days. So I really want to go back to basics and sort of say, where does the modeling come from? We don't, the people who looked at models like this, and they didn't look so much at linear regression, but they looked at uh, uh, related models, um, were sort of post-Newton astronomers, mathematicians, who were trying to do things like predict orbits of planets. So they could make observations of where the planets were, and they had, well, Kepler's laws give them the rules it turns out to be a basis set, Kepler's laws, for how to fit a linear system to these planets. Um, and they had this really interesting problem, which is a problem we still have today, but sometimes I think we don't look at it, and it's an important problem to look at to motivate uh, what comes next. So if we have two observations, so if we know the Olympic marathon time in, I think, 1904 and 1984, that's it. We're done. We've got enough information to fit this model. Um, you've got two simultaneous equations and two unknowns. 
So what more do you do? Well, annoyingly, someone else gave you more data. So they give you a third data point. Well, sorry, this is just the... Sorry, the fit is just given by that, that um, we get M is the uh, sort of gradient between those two, and C therefore becomes uh, computable given either Y1 or um, an X1 or Y2 and X2, and the value we've computed for M. So we get this sort of gradient from here, and then there's some intercept way over there at zero. But what happens if we get this additional Olympic observation in the... What does this look like? This looks like 1956 or something. Um, that's now a problem because we've got an overdetermined system. Um, so, we now have three possible fits that we could put against this model. And people realize this and they said to themselves, well, which of these fits is the correct fit? I mean, that's what people were concerned about in the time of, uh, sort of pre-Laplace. Laplace did a lot of thinking about this, so we're talking 18th century. And they didn't believe that, what they really wanted to do is throw one of these away. They didn't want to sort of average over these solutions because they said, well, some of these measurements will be wrong and other measurements will be right, and we should find the measurements that are right and, and fit to those measurements. And I think that's a really reasonable way of thinking. And what persuaded them that wasn't true was the sort of analysis, I think, originally by Laplace, but Laplace didn't uh, come up with the right density uh, for what we use. So what you could really say is going on is you've got these three simultaneous equations. So these are the things we can't solve. We've got observation x equals 1, y equals 3, x equals 3, y equals 1. And then this annoying third observation that gives us these three simultaneous equations we need to solve for m and c. Now, Laplace had before he, well, not before, but alongside working, or maybe it was before, working on astronomy, he also was very interested in gambling and using probability to think about gambling. Um, and he's got this wonderful paper uh, which is all about uh, what they called English dice. So an English dice was one that was crooked. It comes up unbalanced. I presume in England we called them French dice because uh, there was a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of contretemps between uh, England and France at that time. So they called them English dice. And he said, well, how do you know if a dice is English? <laughs> um, you know, you rolled it a number of times. How, how many times do you have to see it? Now, Laplace actually used Bayesian inference to resolve that question. And he invented something called the Laplace approximation. And he also invented the Gaussian density to do that um, because he couldn't solve it exactly so he did this second order Taylor expansion. So Laplace invented a distribution to do that and he knew about probability and what he said is what should be going on here is that this is my model but then there's some unobserved latent corruption epsilon 1 epsilon 2, epsilon 3 so there's some departure between my model and the real world in statistics, modern statistics would talk about that as a residual, they would talk about that as an error. And Laplace then worked very, very hard to try and come up with reasonable uh, error functions under his, I think it's his principle of indirection, principle of least indirection or something, which was trying to sort of say, if you don't know how the world departs from you, what should you say about this guy here? Now, ironically, even though he, uh, so Demoivre actually invented the Gaussian distribution before Laplace, but Laplace did it independently, um, Gauss actually looked at this and said, well, if you take, and he even references Laplace on the distribution, if you take the error function to be the cumulative density of the Gaussian, then you, uh, these are Gaussian distributed and you recover least squares. So, that wasn't the initial motivation for these squares, but that's why Gauss's name is associated with the Gaussian density, for saying that these things should be distributed in the Gaussian way. But I just want to sort of go back and revisit how they were thinking about it, because we're taught least squares nowadays in a particular way that I think isn't helpful in terms of modeling. We're taught it as an algorithm. We'll get to that algorithm in a bit. But there's a real importance between the separation between model and algorithm that I think is massively um, 
I want to say misunderestimated, because <laughs> um, that was a George Bush word. Uh, so this is something that I think is true in statistics and machine learning and in various other areas. That what happens is someone tries to develop something by developing a model. And then once they developed a model, it implies an algorithm. But then they get so obsessed with the algorithm, they forget what the model was. But thinking of the model is the best way to generalize things. Uh, so the algorithm in this case for optimizing least squares, well, it results in least squares optimization, turns out to be sort of linear algebraic solution to a quadratic. Um, but the model underlying it is this, that you've got a linear, well, it, in this case, linear, um, and then you've got um, Gaussian sampled corruptions. So the Gaussian density was uh, selected for these corruptions. So the problem is solved, the summary of the problem is solved on this slide here, that you have a noise model where you accept that your model of the world is not correct, y equals mx plus c, and then you insert a corruption. You say that the world is like that, plus some disturbance that I'm not modeling. And these may be fluctuations in the atmosphere when you're trying to make the measurements. Whatever, all these errors come together and you assume that they're potentially Gaussian. Now, what people also assumed was that they were independent and identically distributed, which is sensible because certainly with the computations they had at those times, uh, that was about all they could do. So they couldn't go and assume something very complicated. Now in the use of Gaussian processes, it turns out you can put non-independent distributions over these residuals. And I think that's the correct interpretation for a lot of the ways uh, people are using them in, um, in statistics. That there are people who will very often have a parametric model of this form, and then they'll have, say, well, and then there's some corruption, but the corruption is not independent anymore. And so we'll come back to that. And that's interesting because actually in uh, machine learning, we tend to, so they tend to model the sort of departure from their model in the real world with the Gaussian process. In machine learning, um, we tend to use that as the main part of the model. And that confused me for a long time. So the idea of noise models is we're not modeling the entire system. The noise model gives us the mismatch between the model and the data. And the Gaussian model can be justified by appealing to the central limit theorem. So Laplace also, I think, proved the first version of that. Uh, Gauss just pointed out that if you use this error model, you got to least squares. He didn't really justify it. Um, so Laplace did most of the theoretical work around all these things, but didn't put it all together in that one paper, which everyone refers to. Um, so other noise models are also possible. So if you've got, sometimes it's not best to use a Gaussian. In fact, we'll see in these Olympic examples, I don't think the Gaussian noise model is appropriate. Um, but it's all about um, specifying what you think about the data. And this is very important. I'm not going to talk about decision at all in what we study. Um, that's an entire additional area, and the combination of inference modeling and decision is, um, I think that's a very challenging area, but I'm not expert in that area. So notice we're only talking about the data generating process. Now, in other areas of machine learning, uh, the non-probabilistic modeling area where people tend to write the machine learning problem as an optimization problem, so they say, I want to minimize this objective function, they're often conflating these two things. They may be conflating decision with the model. And that can be very valuable and powerful. Um, I don't, I'm not saying one shouldn't do that, but uh, the probabilistic approach to machine learning, I think this is more sort of related a bit the terms Bayesian and frequentist are a bit loaded because they mean different things in different communities. So in machine learning, I tend to think that there's a split between people who optimize, so they write down an objective function and try and optimize it. And that objective function typically includes the cost of incorrect decision. So nowhere in this model is it included the cost of if we mispredict this time. Right? We don't, we haven't said that we're going to make bets on the time of the race or anything like that. We're just trying to make a prediction, the best prediction we can, and we're not talking about the cost of that. 
in other sides of machine learning, which I'm not going to touch on at all, but they're massive areas of machine learning, people would include that cost somehow in their objective and optimize an objective. What we're trying to do here is look at the data creation process and modeling that. And we're doing that probabilistically. Um, okay. Questions at that point? Okay. Okay, I'll push on then with the review. I mean, am I speaking too fast or uh, too slow? Or, <laughs> or just right? No? It's good? Okay. Um, so the Gaussian density, when I was at school, I thought this was the most uninteresting thing anyone could ever have written down. <laughs> and, and I think it probably is. Maybe. It's not if you know all that history. But the way we were taught things at school, we often had to fit Gaussian densities to data and we wanted to compute their mean and their variance. Um, nothing was ever explained about what it meant to assume something was Gaussian. We were just told to this formula, add up all the numbers and divide by n. Which I could remember. I could never remember the formula for the variance, though. And uh, you know, <laughs> in exams, it was all about writing down that formula again. Um, and then, potentially, in those days, we had tables to look up the percentage where you were two standard deviations outside. This seemed to be like everything that I was not un not interested in. Maths was one of my favorite subjects and it seemed to me like someone was making maths about as dull as it could possibly be. Um, so I really didn't get up with statistics as taught at school or undergraduate university at all. I was a mechanical engineer at university so I mean I would get along very well with I was I was giving a talk in Oxford statistics department on Thursday and having a lot of fun. So uh, that's all changed. But I think it, it's a shame that this distribution comes in in such a boring way. I mean, that in the UK, A-level st uh, maths, in my day, you had a choice of doing, I think, mechanics or statistics. And mechanics was free body diagrams, applying Newton's laws, you know, trying to work out how fast this object would move forward. And statistics seem to be about adding up numbers and uh, <laughs> computing tests, perhaps. So um, what's kind of nice is, is having Maurizio as my PhD student is we managed to tie those two things together and, then I, and managed to get back to some of these me mechanistic models, which uh, had always been something I was keen to do, and, and Maurizio made it happen. So here's a potential Gaussian density over um, heights. So the average height here I've put at 1.7 meters. And, I've written down the variance, and I never remember what the square root of that while I'm standing up here, but there's some reasonable variance. And that gives us these standard deviations that, well, this is a little bit high, isn't it? I mean, that's like 2 meters 20. You don't see many people that height. Uh, I'm not. Yeah, I'm there or something, so I'm, I'm shorter than 2 meters. Um, but some distribution over heights. Of course, there's some odd things going on here, because this distribution actually has non-zero probability over negative heights. So that's for British, or I don't know. <laughs> One point seven. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, well, how tall is Rigoberto Oran? He's quite tall, isn't he? Rigoberto. Yeah. Anyone know? People from Antioquia. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. So yeah. I mean, you could have a distribution over heights like this, um, but. The key thing is that it's got two parameters. Sigma squared is the variance and mu is the mean. Now, I think why it's, I found it boring is because it seemed to be, well, I used to think that it was all about the mean. And what I hope you'll understand by the end of this four days is the variance itself, even the marginal variance, isn't important. But it's all about the covariance, how things correlate together. And it's the most, it's when you start getting into multivariate Gaussians and covariances, then you're working with the most wonderful family of models ever, which is why we're doing a four day course on them. Um, but that's not apparent when you're a student. Now, it also has a bunch of remarkable properties, which um, sometimes I like to put it like this the Gaussian distribution is like an old friend, right? A an old and very good friend. And with an old and good friend like that, they may have certain characteristics, like they're really generous, 
and everything else that are very special to them, but you've known them so long that you take it totally for granted. You just know that about them. Now, the Gaussian has properties like that. This first one is a really odd property, and I think it's also a reason why it's an odd, when you're introduced to this ga the distribution, you sort of find none of this very remarkable. But the sum of Gaussian variables is also Gaussian. And the sum is distributed as the sum of yi's is given uh, by a distribution which is the sum of the means and the sum of the variances. Now the fact that it's the sum of the variances, I'm not going to give a mathematical proof of this, but just give a hint at what's going on here, is very important because if you add a bunch of Gaussian numbers up and they've all got the same variance, the resulting variance is n sigma squared. Yeah. So the sum of those things. But if you now divide them all, uh, so if you want the standard deviation of that, it's square root of n sigma squared. And if you divide that by n, so you're looking at the average standard deviation, you end up with a square root factor instead of uh, on the standard deviation instead of an n factor. So the square root scales, sorry, the standard deviation scales with the square root of n. That wouldn't be true if the standard deviation summed rather than the variance is summing. And this is really, really important because this is what it means, this is why taking the mean of Gaussian distributed variables is robust. That's why it's not correct to wait till we get the correct, the best three measurements and just use those. So instinctively we should all know now to average in order to reduce noise. And that's driven by what goes on in the Gaussian distribution. And the, the fact that central limit theorem means things lead towards this Gaussian distribution. But like I said before, in Laplace's time when they first looked at that data, that wasn't instinctively correct. And indeed, there are distributions such as the Cauchy, um, which have... So the Gaussian distribution is, so, is very nice and tight-tailed. The Cauchy distribution has really fat tails. The tails go down to infinity at a rate which is 1 over x. So if you multiply the Cauchy distribution by x, that integral doesn't exist. So it has no mean. Even though it's got a center, you can see it's symmetric about 0, it has no mean. So in that example, you will not find the center of the distribution by summing up all those variables. It's impossible. And you might say, well, that, what are you talking about? How could that possibly exist? Well, there's a lovely, um, well, I say it's a physical example, but here's how you can get a Cauchy distribution. Um, so imagine we're on a coast which is infinite. So, and there's a lighthouse off the coast. And we want to know the location of this lighthouse. And the lighthouse is spinning. And this beam flashes on on off randomly at uniform around this circle. So you might think in order to know where the lighthouse is when you're standing on the coast here you just find where the beam hits the coast from these random things. Of course some you'll miss and you sum up all those values and that will give you the location of the lighthouse. Well that sum doesn't converge and the reason it doesn't converge is because you can get sort of just approximately if this is like the 90 degrees here you can get beams being fired off really close to 90 degrees like at 89.999 degrees and those things hit so far down the coast that regardless of your current value of the sum when that beam hits down there your sum will just increase massively. So you've got some sort of sum of one uh, of, or your values of the sum, so I should be saying the average, not the sum, one over n uh, of xi. You're summing all these things up, and then you get a new xi that is so far away that regardless of the value of n, this sum changes massively. That's what it means for that mean not to converge, for that integral not to converge. Now, it's not really a physical system because there's nowhere do we have infinite coasts and uh, stuff like that. So in practice, uh, but you, you can sort of see it. It's a physical system which can generate this infinite variance and infinite mean behavior. Not even just infinite variance, infinite mean. So the central limit theorem has assumptions that say that that doesn't happen. And if it's true that that doesn't happen, 
that we've got finite variants averaging the sensible idea. If that does happen, we have to deal with outliers. We have to have likelihoods that allow us to deal with outliers. But we're not going to talk much about that. We're just going to say it's possible to do and we'll put it in the model if it's required. But this was, I think, the innovation with the Gaussian that this, these properties meant that um, averaging was a good thing. And that's one of the foundations of statistics. Now, scaling a Gaussian also leads to a Gaussian. So the scaled Gaussian density, if y is Gaussian distributed, wy is w mu and w squared sigma squared. Now that's kind of cool because those two operations are sort of fundamental, aren't they? They're the, um, they're the uh, multiplication and addition. So we're not multiplying Gaussian random variables, but if we sum together Gaussian random variables or if we scale Gaussian random variables, we stay, we're closed within those operations within the Gaussian distribution. Now this one may be less remarkable, but the previous property is very kind of remarkable, partially because even if, even if these were non-Gaussian to start with, as you start summing them up, they become Gaussian. So there are the distributions that this happens for, for example, um, Poisson distributions um, and gamma distributions with a shared scale. They also do that. Maybe other examples that I don't know of. But both those distributions also start to become Gaussian as you add the random variables up. So this thing still applies. They just stay gamma as they become, you know, there's certain variants of the gamma that, are, that become Gaussian and there's certain variants of the Poisson that will look Gaussian. Okay, any questions at that point? So those properties are really important and they're going to knock through to the multivariate properties later on. So let me just see... Okay. Um, yeah, let's just pause for questions and then we'll have a break. Does that make sense? Yeah? So questions at that point? I've done an hour reintroducing the gas. The property of the sum is valid only when the variables are independent. That's not true, um, but it is kind of true. In it's uh, the property of the sum. So I'm assuming now. Yes, I, you're correct. That um. Yes, let me back up. Uh, I should have said, you're right. Um, yes. Th this property here, or do you mean the central limit theorem? Uh, I think both are sort of. So this property here. Uh, I'm assuming independence in this case. We'll come back to it when things are not independent. Um, so we will do an, exactly this operation uh, for a non-independent case. But I haven't introduced the multivariate Gaussian yet. In fact, uh, the variance is, is, is the, uh, the sum of the variance plus the covariance. Yes, but we'll come back to that because one can work all that out given these two rules. Because uh, but we're gonna, th that comes when we do multivariate Gaussians. But absolutely right. And there's also I don't know, you have to, Laplace didn't prove the central limit theorem if these are correlated. If they're correlated, the convergence of the central limit theorem is also slower. Um, so correlations introduce uh, interesting challenges, but it's actually all going to be about correlations when we get to Gaussian processes. Other questions? Okay, so if we pause for a break, for how long? Well, I don't know if you want to do like short breaks or... Uh, I think... Break. What, what do you want to do? Well, I, I want to do what the people want to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, maybe 15 minutes?